Hello and welcome to the DFS Coach Talk podcast. Today is Wednesday, April 22nd, 2020, day 38 of our COVID-19 lockdown. And as you can see, uh, we have been enjoying our contests. And uh, right now, I guess you can tell by uh, the video here that, and for those that are listening on Spotify and some of our other uh, iTunes and such, you can't see it, but Mr. Andrew Hansen is wearing the big crown because he is the leader, and he wanted to make sure that one Mr. Shane Caldwell, who has led for quite some time, is uh, not wearing the crown. So how are you today, Andrew? <laughs> I'm doing well, Coach. Good morning. Yeah, Shane, I hope you I hope you're all right with this. But uh, you know, the last contest is over. You won that. You won your prizes. Really enjoyed hearing you on the podcast earlier this week. But you played that music. You know, the king is in the building. Exactly. And you, you challenged us all to come and take your crown. And right now, I am at the top with two victories. So I'm going to wear this until somebody comes and catches up. There you go, man. You deserve to. That's for sure. And I don't even know if I said I am Joe Sarvati, affectionately known as Coach. And I was so just derailed here by the crown, <laughs> I just got thrown off base. But uh, for our listeners as well, if you listen to us, like I say, through uh, our whole litany of Spotify and iTunes and Apple Pod, any Apple Pod podcasts, iHeart, Spotify, all those, this will be the same as usual. But if you tune in, uh, tune in to us on YouTube, we now have a video component of our show. Today is the first of that video component. So that is going to be fun. Uh, so everyone gets to know our entire team a little bit better because we all, uh, all eight of us actually have some of these teams throughout baseball and football. And, uh, you know, we, we determined, uh, Andrew, that let's start off with the absolute best two looking guys in the whole thing. So that right. we draw Good. in the crowd <laughs> and then it'll get a little bit uglier as we go. But, you know, hopefully we'll be able to carry that. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to get younger as well. We're, yeah. we're really we kind of keep the age up. We you know. are the two oldest. But, you know, that doesn't mean that, uh, you know, age doesn't say that much anyway. But, uh, yeah, it's it's great to be on today. It's It's been, you know, as I said, day 38 with this COVID thing and. I know everybody's getting a little stir crazy, but there are some rumblings of some openings uh, that are happening in some of the states. I know Georgia and Texas, uh, the Carolinas are looking also to start loosening some of the restrictions. The federal government said yesterday uh, we are officially in phase one of the reopening process. So, you know, it's it's starting to feel like we actually will really have baseball, basketball and football back. Uh, before too long it's going to be paradise when we get it back it I doesn't know. matter if the fans are there in person or not we'll be watching through the television and that's that's good enough for me uh, i can't wait i mean you know i i got you got to think it's going to happen i mean there's just too much revenue tv revenue <clears throat> to be lost there if they don't do it and uh i posted something i don't know if you had a chance to to check out our discord and by the way, if you want to become a member, uh, you, you can check more information out about us at DFSCoachTalk.com. Uh, you can follow us on Twitter at DFSCoachTalk. And our memberships are frozen until sports begins. So if you do join, it's frozen. There's not a day off your membership. Uh, we offer a weekly, monthly, or annual uh, membership. Uh, and you can enjoy our Discord and our contests, obviously, that everybody takes serious as uh, Andrew here is wearing the crown at this moment. But, uh, you know, we have a lot of fun in there. But I posted something last night. I just, you know, the, every once in a while, my coaching background stirs me up. And I think, you know, I, I want to get this out there because it, it, it is tough being, I mean, we've never gone through anything like this before. And it is, it gets, it can get you down a little bit or a little anxious but, you know, if, if you have a chance to join or jump in there, it was just sort of a, you know, uh, really goes to what we're doing here at DFS Coach Talk, even before this COVID-19 thing hit. And that's preparation and just confidence and focus 
and being all in. Um, we only do three sports, basketball, football, and baseball, because we want to be the very best in the industry as a DFS provider with all three sports. So, you know, the, the key factor is we could be wasting time that right now and looking at all these different things, the Sims, the League of Legends and everything else, but we're focusing on a daily di deep dive on <clears throat> every NBA team, which we've already done. And we're in the middle of baseball and we're going to go into football and hopefully we can squeeze these all in prior to the start of sports. And we feel strongly that it's going to give us a big edge because, you know, we're, we're looking into the details and for those that are new, maybe just uh, saw these two ugly faces on here and said, what the hell is that? <laughs> <laughs> I speak for myself, man. You look great with the King, <laughs> the King's uh, crown on, but uh, the, you know, that is really our motto here. You know, we're, if, you know, I won't go back into my background and everything, but that Mamba mentality is something that I've used as a mantra for my life, actually, not just my DFS and sports world, but uh, I really believe in that. I, you know, it's either to me, it's an all in or, or all out kind of uh, effort. And that's what we want all of our members and all of our team uh, to really, really, uh, show and live by every day. So, you know, win, lose, or draw, we're going to be putting all of the information forward, every detail to build the best lineups every day. And that's why we're spending all this time uh, in this shutdown period to really just dive in and crush everything. So uh, we're going to, we're going to look at the Mariners and Rangers today and talk about, you know, where they were at, what to look for coming up, uh, sort of give a feel for anything that <clears throat> we think may hurt or help with this COVID-19 shutdown. You know, we've noticed a lot of guys in different sports, as you know, Andrew, that are using this time to sort of sit there and play 2K or do whatever. And then there's other guys that are in the gym every day and getting shots up and are going to be ready. So, you know, that goes same for baseball and football. So we're tracking all of that stuff because we want to win day one. We want to get that edge. You know, there's going to be a lot of providers that are saying, you know, let's see how this plays out. Let's, you know, let's you know, coast the first couple of weeks. You know, we want our normal winning percentage, 75%. With all of this work we're doing, I think we can smash that the first couple of weeks, build ourselves a nice bankroll to take forward uh, especially since most of the sports are all going to be going at the same time. So you're going to have to be really focused and disciplined and ready to attack it. So that was sort of my soapbox today. I refer to it a little bit in Discord, uh, and I really would encourage you to dive in and, and join us. Uh, a lot of, good, lot of good stuff. I'll mention it one more time. DFSCoachTalk.com is the website. You can read about us there, sign up there. Uh, you'll meet all our, our team on there. So if you're terrified of seeing their faces on these uh, podcasts, you'll at least get to, to be ready by seeing their faces on our website. And, uh, and then as, as far as Twitter goes at DFS coach talk, I'm at Joe Sarvati, J O E S A R V A D I. And Andrew is at language Olympic. So that that's uh, how you can reach out to us and be feel free to give us any responses. Uh, let us know what you want to hear on the next show, anything like that. So that is where we at man. We're at man. So since I'm doing all the chitter chatter, how about we start off with the Seattle Mariners? Sure thing. So the first message for Seattle as we get into 2020 is the king of hitting Ichiro is no longer in town. That was last year when he had that cameo beginning of the season, got a few at-bats, wrapped up in Japan. Just an incredibly emotional finish to an absolutely incredible career. Loved watching him play. And you, you mentioned Twitter, Coach, and one thing I tweeted here in the last 24 hours was this graphic uh, from a guy named Darren Willman. He does a lot of really fascinating uh, baseball graphics and videos. And it's a it's a map of the Major League Baseball field cut into these 20 feet by 20 feet sections. And he's got the, the name of the batter 
plastered in that section who had the most hits between wow. 2000 and 2020. And Ichiro's name is all over the field. I mean, he, own, he, he owns the infield. He owns the middle in front of the center fielder. And so you can just picture him getting that, you know, those thousands and thousands of hits, infield hits, line drive singles, just an incredible player. Uh, and, you know, as great as he was, that's that's the unfortunate thing for the Mariners is that he's gone. King Felix is gone. You know, speaking of Kings. That's so, huge. That's even bigger, really. Yeah. I mean, he was he was their their pop for sure. And he was there forever. And so it's it's a whole new look with the batters and the pitchers. They've gone young. You know, last year they were 68 and 94. They've admitted it's a rebuild. They're not going to try to make the playoffs this year. They've gone young. So, you know, as we go through the order here, there's not a lot to be excited about. Um, Did you see King Felix's last game? That was so uh, heart-wrenching, you know, when he uh, waved to the crowd and the whole nine yards. And, I mean, he was there. Their man, he was he was so good for so long, uh, but it's it's amazing to me, Andrew, how fast careers go by. I mean, oh. I guess as you get older, you see it, but it's like, man, I I remember this guy's first at bat like it was yesterday, mm -hmm. and then boom, all the next thing he's retired, and uh, the, a guy with his name with the junior on it is up there. I'm mm -hmm. like, wait a minute, this can't be happening, but. Uh, I'll I tell know. you, speaking of that, I just want to make one comment because I'm such an Ichiro fan, too. You know, he came over here when he was at toward the end of his prime. He played a ton of ball over in Japan. So if he would have been here his whole career, he'd have broken hit records that no one would have ever touched. But he was fun to watch, man. Yeah, I mean, if you combine his hits over there professionally, he had more hits than Pete Rose. He really yes. is the hit king in, in my book. He is. So, Maybe you should send him a copy of that crown there. Yeah, I mean, he deserves it. <laughs> <laughs> I got to thank my kids made this for me this morning when you confirmed that we we're going to be on video today. Yes. They got this it is together the real quick. first ever, too. Yeah. So we, we have created history. Uh, hopefully <laughs> that people can remember and not, uh, you know, uh, turn us off. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so as we look at the Seattle lineup, um, not only are they, they missing Ichiro, but one of their best young players, Mitch Haniger, is out due to injury. He had multiple surgeries this spring mm -hmm. on his core. Um, he had one in January and one in February. Um, now, will this, will this layoff allow him to maybe come back at the end of the season? They still haven't announced when he's going to return. I'm guessing maybe mid-season, you know, assuming we start in June or early July. It, it sounds like he'll get he'll get back at some point, but... They, yeah. still haven't, they still haven't announced a return date. And this is a guy who, in 2018, was 11th in the AL MVP voting. Oh, yeah. He was playing so, good ball. Yeah. You know, he's really one of their studs. That year, he hit 26 homers, knocked in 93, batted 285. So he'd be right in the heart of their lineup. But he's out indefinitely. So not a lot of excitement to talk about. But let's go through the lineup here. Leading off, I'm expecting it to be Shed Long, second baseman. And he... He batted 263 with five homers, decent slugging percentage for leadoff guy at 454 last year. Yeah, uh, he was acquired in a trade last year, so he just played part of the season. Um, but you know, nothing really jumping out in terms of numbers that I'd want to invest in. How many at bats did he get? Do you know, he only got 152 at bats. See that? So. Yeah. So that's you know, those numbers. Some of those numbers aren't bad. I mean, yeah. if he does lead off for them all year, and they do play close to a full season he could get 500 at bats and maybe that's a whole different ball game yeah maybe he's pushing closer to 20 home runs which which is solid for somebody to keep an eye on yeah keep an eye on him next in the lineup uh at least against right-handed pitchers is another guy in the middle of the infield jp crawford another young guy he's only 25 last year he he only batted 226 yeah only seven home runs in 345 at bats, so played more than half the season. And as a lefty, the one thing to know in terms of splits is he's absolutely terrible against lefties. He batted 160 against lefties yeah. last year. So just kind of the prototypical um, middle infielder, slap hitter type guy. Um, but he doesn't bat well over 300 like Ichiro. So I don't plan I've to. I've got a, a funny story to tell you on him. 
uh, you, and I'm sure other DFS players will relate to this in different sports. I just happened to need like a minimum salary guy. So I plugged him into my lineup one day and he had his best game of the whole year. Really? So yeah, Beautiful. he had like 25, 28 fantasy points for a guy that was min price. So you know how that in, goes into your brain oh, yeah. like, oh, I like this guy. He's up and coming. Right. And then the next like three or four times it was goose egg city. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you this, <clears throat> the reason why I would put a little X next to his name as a no, no, he gets pinch hit for all the time, mm -hmm. dude. Mm -hmm. Like you said, he stinks yeah. from the one side of the plate. So, mm -hmm. you know, yes, he may hit higher in the order, but he still may only get two or three at bats at most. Cause when they switch uh, the pitcher, uh, he's going to get yanked. Yeah, that's a great point. The, the one positive note for him is he did hit 400 this spring, 10 for 25. So wow. decent sample size for spring training. So maybe he'll be better this year. But he's got wheels, I can tell you that. He, yeah. he really does. He, got a, he, he stole a few bags. He got five bags last year. They really don't yeah. have much speed in this lineup. Yeah. Uh, number three is an actual, real, legitimate Major League veteran with some, some stats behind him. That's Kyle Seeger, of course. Last year, he had 23 home runs. In only 393 at bats, and then he got a hand injury, so yeah. he he didn't play the whole season. Um, now a guy with that sort of pop is certainly worth considering. The one thing I want to mention about him, the the key DFS takeaway here is that he's always off to a bad start. Yeah, very slow um, starter. Very slow starter. Was he bad in spring as well? Uh, this spring he was 316. He was six for 19 with no home runs. So he was he was all right. That's on fire for him for spring. Yeah, right. he's he's notoriously. I'll tell you, he's a Ranger killer. By the way, when the Rangers and I, I obviously being in Dallas, I get to see some Ranger games. And whenever they play Seattle, he is the single guy that just has the Rangers number. He mm. he kills them. Now maybe it was the ballpark. The Rangers mm -hmm. are going to be playing in a new ballpark, so that might go down. But Notoriously, when you go to see him, if you see the Mariners play in April, you can almost, well, not now, it'll be whenever it is, but, you know, in the first month of the season, he's like 156, 186, but then he'll start heating up and, and play well. But yeah, definitely, I don't care if he batted 300 in spring, he is a guy to put on your do not take this guy for the first month of the season, because he's not the cheapest and you're going to possibly get a zero. I'll tell you what, Seattle stinks, too. I'm just going to throw that in there right now. They're mm -hmm. lousy this year. Yeah. They are going to be out of the race before you can blink. But all right, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, and, and one more point on that. You might think, well, maybe that's just because of the cold weather. But last year, actually, he didn't start until June. And again, he was terrible in that first month. So even though they may not start until the Good warm point. weather this year, still going to fade him that first month. Next in the lineup is Daniel Vogelback. And this is a pop. guy who he's got some pop. He hit 30 home runs last year. Um, he's a, here's the key takeaway for him. We do want to play him the first month. Last year, he batted 328 in April. Wow. All right. So he got off to a good start. Didn't finish well. I mean, he only batted 208. Yeah. Um, he was an all or nothing kind of dude, though. He could yeah. put a double dinger up there for you. Right. And. One other split to watch with him. He's also terrible against lefties. He only batted 161 against them, and he only hit five of his 30 home runs against lefties. So um, let's only take a flyer on him to go yard against the righties. You know, they even talked about last year. I remember uh, listening to the announcers on the the ticket, and so you got the hometown announcers for Seattle. He actually considered not switch hitting anymore because it was such a, a, a heavy split. So I'll be interested. I don't know, you know, what he did in the spring or whatever, but we'll have to follow that because, you know, I, I think he's probably better off just, you know, swinging from the right side. I mean, that's, he, I mean, his average from the right side was a lot better too. So something, something to keep an eye on. Cause if he does, I think he'll be more consistent. Next guy in the lineup is Kyle Lewis, corner outfielder. And that's their number five hitter. Well, it, it seems like they're, yeah, right. The guy who had uh, 71 at bats last year, uh, 24 year old. It, it seems to me like they might put Tom Murphy in the five hole, the catcher. 
and and put Lewis down. But Lewis, he actually batted cleanup several times this year in spring training. So, wow. Um, Boy, Vogelbach's you know, not going to get anything to hit, by the way, either. They're going right. to pitch around him. Right. So Lewis, um, Kyle Lewis was a call up in September. He got those 71 at bats. He hit six home runs during that time and a 592 slugging. Yeah. And he he has hit three home runs in spring already. So um, maybe he's we'll, a budding star there, then something could to be. watch. Yeah. Could be. Um, the next guy, Tom Murphy, I mentioned him, the catcher. And he's the first guy that I'm actually likely to invest in um, because he is a catcher who only costs 2400 at least in these simulations. But if he's going to be min price, I think it's worth it for a, a position like catcher. He had 18 home runs last year and only 260 at-bats. So uh, pretty good power numbers there. And um, at one of the advanced stats – that people like to look at the exit velocity. He was fifth among catchers last year with his average exit velocity of 90.7. He's also hmm. just side note, great at throwing out runners. So he's a guy that they you know, are going to put out there as, as often as they can, you know, as, as long as he's healthy. So, well, there's uh, not a lot of catchers that bat in the middle of the lineup. Let's face it. So, yeah, you know, where it. you do have to roster a catcher, he sounds like a, a very good possibility. Absolutely. Next, we've got Evan White, who's interesting Who? because yeah, Evan <laughs> White, he hasn't even played in the majors yet, but they signed him to a six-year, $24 million deal. Wow. Yeah. So they locked him in long-term, sort of the Scottie Pippen deal, right? Hell, Seven don't, years, don't get months. me started on that, dude. <laughs> Lock I, him if in. I see one more tweet about poor <laughs> Pippen, yeah. look at just all I'll have to say for all those people crying about Pippen Go to career earnings mm -hmm. for Scottie Pippen and yep. then tell me if you're crying for the guy. He's got more money than all of us put together times 10. Yep. So forget it. He did yeah. fine. <laughs> yeah. So this Evan White character in double A last year, he hit 293 with 18 home runs, 55 knocked in, and 365 at bats. So, you know, they're obviously hoping that that power translates to the big leagues and, and they're taking that long term investment. So we'll see. Yep. It can wait, pay wait off. See. I've seen, you know, teams do it with other players like that before they even get called up, and a lot of times it it pays off. So we'll see. I know uh, the Phillies did that with Kingry a little bit, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, he's an everyday solid player for them, mm -hmm. so it can work out. Yep. Yep. Eight and nine hitters are the other outfielders. Jake Fraley is a 24 year old. He got called up in August of last year. Didn't play well. Uh, just batted 150 in just 40 at bats, uh, so uh, we'll wait and see on him. He did hit two home runs this spring so far. And the ninth spot looks like it's going to be Malik Smith, who's the only guy that's going to steal bags for you. And he actually had 46 stolen bases last year. Yeah, didn't do a whole lot else in his 510 at bats. He only hit six home runs, slugging only 335. So really, just a speed guy. And in these in these simulations, he's priced at thirty two hundred. So there's no chance I'm going to pay that price. No, I mean you know people over they get over excited about speed, but mm. you know he did a lot of that batting at the top of the order last year. Mm. So if he's batting in the eight or nine hole, you know that's that makes it a, a little rough uh, rough deal there. Yep. So, yeah. Um, only two other hitters off the bench, uh, off the bench that I'll mention, other than Hanniger coming back, is D. Gordon, who you know, he's the other guy with some speed, and it's pinch, funny that pinch hitter or yeah, pinch runner. I mean, I'm pinch sorry. runner. You know, he can play both infield positions up the middle. He can play outfield. Um, he all, he had 22 stolen bases last year, 330 career stolen bases. Yeah, um, but. You know, not a guy who's going to play that much. They want to play the young guys. And then Tim Lopes is another sort of utility guy, outfield second base, probably will bat against left-handed pitchers. And he only had 111 at-bats last year. But this spring he batted 440. Hmm. Um, is 11... his dad Davey Lopes? That I don't know. It's a good question. Look at that one. Yeah. Uh, batted 11 for 25 this spring, so – you know, another guy to keep an eye on. But overall, again, really for these hitters, I mean, Tom Tom Murphy at a value price at 2400 with some pop, you know, maybe Vogel, Vogel back early in the season. Um, 
but I, I'm not planning to play these hitters much at all in the early going. Well, if they play a regular 162, they're going to lose 100 games. I mean, I'm mm-hmm. just telling you, they, they, I think in looking over baseball as a whole, they're definitely one of the teams that is not going anywhere this year. But, you know, if they're building for the future, sometimes you got to take a, a year or two to take your lumps uh, and then go from there. But do they have any pitching? Not much. They've got one guy who's solid. That's Marco Gonzalez, lefty. Yeah. He, he tops was good out last year. Yeah, he tops out at about 89, so he's more of a crafty lefty. Yeah. He did manage to get 16 wins for this team. Hard which, to believe. I mean, that's yeah. almost 25% of their team wins. Wow. That's, so ERA just under four, and he was reliable. He started 34 games. Not not a great strikeout guy, though. Only 6.5 yeah. per nine innings. Doesn't yeah. give up many homers. Um, and interesting in these simulations, he's really cheap, sixty five hundred. Yeah, you know, for a guy, well, he I averaged... mean, the way DFS is set up, Andrew. Let's face it, you have to have the strikeout guys. Yeah. I mean, it just yeah. there's so much of an award to have strikeout guys that people like Marco get lost in the shuffle, and he's mm-hmm. a damn good pitcher. He knows yep. the strike zone. He can hit the corners, but he's not going to overpower you. And it's, I, I wish there was, if there was one rule, they could. Sc- Wish down the points for power pitchers. That would be great mm-hmm. to me, but yeah. it's not going to happen. So, yeah. <clears throat> yeah. So you'd have to target him against a team that's that's poor against left-handed pitchers and and poor overall. So you can try to predict the wins because he can pick up the wins for you. Um, but he's their ace. So there you go. Yeah. Next, looking like the uh, the guy in the number two slot will be you say Kikuchi a lefty from Japan who really had a yeah. poor season last year, six and 11. Oh, five. I stacked against him more than any other baseball yep. pitcher in the league. I really did. And yep. I took a lot of stuff down uh, mm-hmm. stacking against him. Mm-hmm. I mean, he gives up a lot of contact. He does talk about barrel two home runs per nine innings. Gee. Yeah. And a 1.515 whip. So, yeah. Wouldn't plan to ever use him, but absolutely stack against him. They did say that he's really been trying to streamline his 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 windup this year and improve his mechanics. So we'll see. 4.05 ERA this spring in 6.2 innings, small sample size. He did get 10 strikeouts um, in those 6.2 innings. But, but yeah, we'll continue to stack against him until he, he tells us otherwise. Yeah, he did come highly regarded when he first came up. That's why... It was nice to stack against him because a lot of people read the press clippings of, yep. hey, this guy's going to be a good one. Right. And he can strike people out. And, man, he was getting lit up like uh, no, like uh, 4th of July. Right. <laughs> now, the next guy is another lefty, and he's a younger guy. He's 23. It's Justice Sheffield. This is a guy who's got some power. He throws in the mid-90s. And he was— Now, this has to be Gary Sheffield's kid. That's another good point. I think that, it is. I'm not sure. I didn't check on that. I'm pretty sure it is. And I think they named him Justice after Dave Justice. I think I read yeah. that somewhere. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah. yeah, and he's 23. So there you go. We're talking about the second generation here. Yeah, I mean, it's what are you going to do? You get the, the two old guys on together, and you're going to get all those throwback stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you're yep. 10 years older than me, but, you know, right, I, I consider right. myself in the same... Uh, <laughs> Although you had a more, you just had a birthday, so you're catching up. You, you, yeah. You've extended your lead. I have extended <laughs> an, an uncatchable lead, by the way. <laughs> That's right. That's right. <laughs> so Sheffield got 36 innings of work last year, 37 strikeouts. Like I said, big power arm. He was just 0 1 with a five and a half ERA. But this spring, 2.25, eight innings of work in 12 Ks. Hmm. So this is a number three starter, likely who. You could look at for some some big strikeouts. I mean, he doesn't have many innings under his belt, so we'll we'll see what he can do in terms of stamina. Um, but uh, a good young a good young prospect to keep an eye on. Sure. Guy that likely could be a four starter is Kendall Graveman, uh, journeyman who had good Tommy boy. John surgery in eighteen, didn't pitch in the majors last year. His uh, career, so I'll give you his career stats, 23 and 29 with a 4.38 ERA. Not much of a strikeout guy, only 5.8 per nine innings for his career. He did have a solid year in 2016 with the A's, 
31 starts, 186 innings, but again, only 108 strikeouts. So definitely not a guy to use. And pass, as, pass for me. Yeah, <laughs> pass and potentially attack. Um, stack up against him. Stack up against him. The, the other two guys I want to mention as potential fifth starters are uh, younger guys. Taiwan Walker, he's been around a little bit, career 31 and 31 with an ERA under four. Yeah. He, but he also had Tommy John surgery in 2018, only pitched one inning in the big mm. leagues last year. So they're, they're hoping he'll come back. He's, he's a better strikeout guy like Sheffield, uh, career 8.1 per nine innings. I know when he was he was in that Baseball America Top 100 back a while back. I know he was highly thought of potential wise, but and I'll tell you, let's face it, most of these guys end up getting Tommy John one time or another. Mm-hmm. It seems mm-hmm. to happen, and you know it takes that one season. I mean, you see it constantly. The first season after Tommy John is sort of like a developmental year, and then a lot of guys the second year after Tommy John are even stronger than they were before the Tommy John. So it's a mm-hmm. bizarre uh, thing, but, you know, that you could follow that pretty closely in baseball, and, and it plays out like that a lot. Yes, it does. So his best year was back in 2015. He had 169 innings and 157 strikeouts, and his whip was just 1.196. Nice. So let's see if he's healthy after the Tommy John. Um, could be a guy to, to watch. The other guy is Justin Dunn, 24-year-old. He got called up in September of last year, uh, 2.7 ERA, just six six 6.2 innings pitched. Um, same thing this spring, 6.2 innings pitched, 10 strikeouts, ERA of 2.7. So he's that guy who could be a fifth starter. Maybe they'll start him at AAA, uh, but he's one of their key prospects. So, again, um, you know, with Marco Gonzalez being the ace, quote-unquote, of this staff, yeah. it's just not looking to be a very good year. So, um, you know, maybe maybe avoid good Marco Gonzalez, but we're going to stack against Kikuchi, and then we'll we'll keep an eye on these younger guys and and see who develops. Yeah, it's going to be a long year for our listeners and members that are Mariners fans. You know, you'll be yeah. lucky that there'll at least be some Seahawks going on probably uh, right. before you know it. So <laughs> that's one thing. And uh, you know, I heard too, if the NBA does expand, Seattle's uh, number one. Mm-hmm. to get a team back and they deserve it i mean yeah. i'll tell you those years of watching the seattle supersonics uh they had fantastic fans they should have never lost their team that that was just a, a crime and, and they had good teams too i mean mm-hmm. we're talking you know their glory days they were just absolutely stacked so yeah. uh, i hope they get a, a team back at some point for sure yeah that'd be great for the nba i think it'll happen at some point i think so Definitely. So that's so, uh, that's all I got for Seattle. Yeah, it's definitely a uh, a tough team, tough season coming for them. I think they want it to be as short as possible. They'd love playing, you know, a hundred games or less. Mm-hmm. I'm sure, but uh, but anyway, you know, as I say, you can now listen to us as always, a seven day a week podcast uh, on all of our different outlets where you can listen to the audio portion of this. And that's on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, Podbean, iHeart, Spotify, and YouTube. But the YouTube component of it now will have video. So if you do want to, uh, you know, scare the children and the pets and everybody else that may walk by the the computer and see us, uh, then you're welcome to do that uh, just to give them a little scare here in the COVID days. But, uh, you know, we'll be on YouTube. I'll be posting this video-wise on our Twitter uh, the DFS Coach Talk Twitter, and, uh, you know, just give our, our, really the reason we wanted to switch to the video piece of it is we want to just connect more with with our listeners and members. Uh, you know, it's, it makes a big difference physically seeing somebody as opposed to just hearing their voice, and uh, good, bad, or indifferent, I think it'll just uh, help us all get on the same page but, uh, until, you know, when sports come back now, and then you know, we'll be ready to rock and roll. So um, other than that, though, really just, you know, join in, jump on. Uh, we're having a lot of fun and uh, we're going to be more ready than anybody else in the industry by a mile. Uh, all right. I get to go in. We'll go with my hometown team here, the Texas Rangers, who I get a chance to see 
usually at least about a half a dozen games a year. Uh, and I'm ecstatic about the new ballpark. Have you seen the new ballpark, Andrew? I haven't. Oh, my gosh. It is unreal. It is connected to – it's a humongous building that is connected to, like, a nightclub, restaurants. I mean, it's so state-of-the-art. And it's in, you know – one parking lot away from Jerry's world. So you look at those mm-hmm. stadiums and it's just mind boggling, but uh, it's a retractable roof similar to Houston. And, you know, the biggest part, the problem for Texas the last 20 years, why they haven't really been able to get over the top is players don't want to play, you know, 50 games in 110 degrees. And sometimes it's 125 degrees on the, artificial turf there or whatever the case may be even if it's the grass turf and it's just it wears you down it hurts you know hurts all parts of your body and now that they're going to have the controlled environment uh it's supposed to be uh, a neutral field as far as hitting versus pitching but you know i think it'll be a better draw for pitchers to come here as the rangers signed Corey kluber for example uh you know they've got him in the mix this year and I think it's gonna. I think you're gonna see an upswing the next couple of years in some better players signing with the Rangers because you know Dallas is a great city. The fan base is phenomenal. Uh, it's a great place to raise a family for sure. And now that you know there's an actual stadium that uh, is not gonna create shortening of careers, which really it does uh, when you have to play in that those type of conditions. I think you're gonna see a big jump. So. I'm expecting to, you know, that that to begin sooner than later uh, with the Rangers. But let me give you a, a snapshot of of what they did last year, and you know, when we're looking at the lineup, we'll see where things are going to uh, improve. Uh, unfortunately, they only batted 248 as a team, which was 17th in the league. Uh, you know, a lot of guys just swinging for the fence because the old ballpark was just such a huge home run style park. Uh, you just need to get the ball up in that uh, breeze, and, and a lot of times it'll just uh, shoot right out of there. But here's the thing that shocked me, even as somebody that watches the Rangers, and well, I gave it away now, or I was going to throw one of my famous quizzes at you. But out of the the teams in the 30 teams in Major League Baseball, the Rangers were 16th in homers, and that's considering the ballpark they play half their games at last year uh that's just horrible now a lot of that was because gallo was out and you know mm-hmm. they had guys hurt but still i mean that's that's pretty surprising i i think you're gonna see with a little bit stronger lineup now that those numbers you know even though it's a more neutral ballpark i think you're gonna see those go up a little bit rbi wise uh you know again you know the They're, you know, not where you would expect them to be, uh, considering the fact that the ballpark they played in, 13th, so somewhat close to the middle of the pack, uh, 765 uh, RBIs. And then, um, you know, on the the speed side, uh, you know, that's that's where, you know, we got to look up and down. I mean, obviously, they stack their lineup to try to hit home runs uh, in that ballpark, so uh, that's that was one instance, but where do you think they finished in stolen bases last year in, in the, in all of baseball? You know, um, I'm going to say in the top half, because a number that jumped out at me is Elvis Andrews getting 31 stolen bases last year. And I didn't realize he's over 300 for his career. Now you talk about baseball careers, just flying by, you know, it seems like just yesterday he was a young, uh, a young batter. Um, and then Santana, you know, I noticed how he's 2020. Yeah. So, you know, a lot of these teams don't have two guys in their starting lineup with over 20. So I'm going to say top 10. How about one? And there Isn't you go. That shocking. So you got a team that you would think would stack hitters for power. They stole 131 bases, which is first in the league. And that's exciting because I think. Under the conditions of the new ballpark, the fact that they have so many young guys with wheels and they're even adding more speed, uh, I think that's going to be a huge weapon in their game. I mean, that is, I know, you know, 
when I follow baseball the closest, like back in the eighties and stuff, you know, speed was a huge component of the game. And then, and that's, I'm even talking about during the steroid stuff, you know, during the Sosa, Canseco, McGuire, all those guys hitting a million home runs, all juiced up. The, it, stealing was still important that the games were managed with, you know, bunt the guy over or let him steal. And now it's just station to station across mm-hmm. baseball. But mm-hmm. I think that there may be a little resurgence in uh, the base pass because, you know, that began to be a trend towards the end of last year a little bit. And I know the Rangers put a lot of emphasis on it. And, uh, you know, I, I'm excited to see where that goes. But when you're rostering your DFS lineup, you know, and you're deciding between a few guys and you see some of those Rangers with the ability to swipe a couple of bags in one game, you know, that can catapult you in, uh, in your DFS tournaments because, uh, you know, those are some points that most guys are not going to get. So something to definitely watch. And something that I don't think anybody would have guessed that they were uh, first in the league in steals. Nobody. So that that's a good uh, good quiz question there. Um, and then as f- let's go right into uh, first of all, they finished the season last year, seventy eight and eighty four. As you know, they got off to a great start. They were right in the midst of of uh, you know being a true contender and being in the m- middle of things <clears throat> before Houston went berserk. Um, and so, you know, to be six games below 500 with really no Gallo and, and a lot of things not going well, uh, I think lends to the fact that, you know, they're, they're going to show some serious improvement this year. I really think they are. The crowds once were allowed back. See, that's the other thing Mm -hmm. you talk about teams that are affected by that, you know, let's face it. When the Mariners aren't playing good, they still get good crowds when the Rangers, aren't playing good. They get good crowds. So teams like that, that hurts. But teams like Detroit or the White Sox or whoever, when they stink, you see their crowds dwindle, you know, the Indians, whomever. And, you know, there's a difference in actually being able to play in your park with fans that you need to really look at for some teams compared to the others. So we've talked about that quite a bit. But as we find out what they're going to do, Uh, then we'll start incorporating those in our projected numbers and and stats because we still don't know. I mean, you know, that's, are they going to play in Florida and Arizona? Are they going to play in their home parks with no fans? Who knows? So uh, we have to wait to see that aspect, but at least having all of that information is, is key. I think to uh, lining up for a successful start as soon as DFS gets back. All right, we'll start off with the leadoff hitter, uh, Chin Su Chu. He's been a steady uh, player on the team for quite some time. Signed that big fat contract, but he's done you know a pretty decent job. I uh, had 517 at bats uh, last year with 21, 60, and 11 as far as 11 steals. But the only concern was he batted 263, and he was always a 300 type hitter, top 10 hitter uh, in the league, slapping the ball to bases. Uh, and and believe it or not, he struck out 145 times, which is a career high for him. So I'm not sure what's going on there if we're seeing a regression because he's not as young as he used to be. But there's, they're still planning on putting him at the top of the order, and he still can cause some trouble if he gets hot. So hopefully he'll have a resurgence if they get to play in that new ballpark. Coach, I want to tell you a story about Chu. Sure. So, you, you, as you know, I played minor league ball. I played three years of independent professional yeah. baseball. And two of those years were in San Angelo, Texas. And my final year, I would train in Florida and drive out to Texas. So as I was driving to West Texas, I stopped in San Antonio in 2004 and watched Chu play as a minor leaguer. Wow. He played double A ball back in 2004. He was with, That was when he was with the Mariners organization. And... The funny thing was, is, you know, I, I'd heard of him as a prospect. And so he's one of the guys I remember watching play. And he, what I remember about him is that he was pretty small. I mean, this guy really bulked up and that was the year when he started to finally show his power that year, he hit 15 home runs, bad yeah. 315. And then the next year he was in the big leagues, but you talk about time flying by. I just cannot believe I can still picture him. And that was, 
16 years ago. He was 21 years old. And here wow. he is. You know, that was the last year I played professional ball. And, and here he is. He's 37 years old. He's still playing. It's just so still, hard to and believe. And leading off, no less. Yeah. That's what's amazing. But, yeah. I mean, I, I got to think he's wearing out. I mean, he's had a long run. So uh, I think the age is probably catching up to him a little bit. Well, he had to play, again, I, not to be repetitive, but he had to play all those games in that heat, too. Mm -hmm. I mean, that mm -hmm. really does take a toll on your career. Yeah. So I don't know. Maybe this is the, the swan song for, mm -hmm. for Chu. I know that big contract that everybody barks about here, you know, he got a real sweetheart deal. I think that'll be expiring pretty soon. So, mm -hmm. you know, but, uh, you know, it, it, he's one of those guys that when you're in the ballpark watching him, he just looks like he's going to find a way to get on base. You know, mm -hmm. he's one of those, uh, you know, veteran guys, I guess mm -hmm. you could say. So mm -hmm. that'll be very interesting. That's a great story, though. And he is getting old, man. Mm -hmm. He really is. Mm -hmm. It should be you. It should be Andrew Hanson. I know it. For the Rangers, man. Well, talk about steroids. If I'd taken steroids, maybe. But I decided it, I wasn't I wasn't going that route. He bulked and, uh, up like a son of a gun. So that's for sure. That was the same year, actually. I worked out so hard in the offseason. I got to spring training, and the guys thought I was using steroids. Ah. And it, but it was all natural. But, you know, just a lot of push-ups, you know, um, trying to make it happen, and, and it just didn't just didn't happen. So I had to hang them up. Hey, you know, you got a ride out there, though. That's yep. fun to see. So good. Yep. That, that's good stuff. All right, batting second, uh, you know, the, the legend for the, the Rangers right now, Elvis Andrus. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, had uh, 12 homers last year. Very disappointing. He had shown a uh, ton of pop uh, the couple of years prior. 66 ribbies, but still stole 22 bases, like you say, uh, and batted 273. You know, still a wizard at the sh at shortstop, though. He's got such a fine glove, and he still gets to balls even at a more advanced age now than a lot of guys do. So. He's solidified in that two hole. And if you pick him in the right matchup against the right pitcher, uh, there's a lot of BVP stuff with Elvis that is true. You know, certain pitchers he crushes and certain pitches he just pitchers he doesn't hit. And, you know, you get a pretty good sample size with him now because he's been around so long. But he is the mainstay and I think will bat uh, toward the top of that order all year. Um of course, the, the big thing is Joey Gallo, mm -hmm. uh, pretty much the best player on the team with the most potential. Um, you know, his injury was uh, pretty devastating for the Rangers last year, but he has a phenomenal amount of power. Yes, he, he strikes out like a maniac, but if he gets a hold of it, man, forget it. So, you know, the, the problem is the batting average. He's got to find a way to get on base more. I mean, it's that simple. I mean, it, the 41 homers, 89 RBI, six steals, all of that is really good. You know, uh, you got to love that. But 222 average with 210 strikeouts, that that stings. So uh, hopefully he's he's going to fine tune that a little bit because uh, he certainly has superstar potential. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I think, uh, let's see here. Um Last year, 114 strikeouts in only 241 at bats. That is right. a horrific ratio. It's beyond belief. The, but, the stats I gave <laughs> were his last full season, but right. yeah, he, uh, yeah, he, he was on a course to break all the records for sure. Crazy. So, uh, but you know, I think he's he's athletic enough that I think he can fine tune that a smidge you know i mean i know a lot of guys just get up there and they try to hit a home run every single time but you know if the rangers become competitive you know and you gotta hit a sack fly or move somebody over he seems like the kind of guy good character guy that will do that mm -hmm. so we'll see we'll see how it pans out um one guy i love to root for is danny santana i mean he is a guy came up through the system uh, great attitude. A lot of people had given up on him. But, you know, you look at his stats, 24, 73, and 19. You know, here's another guy that can steal some bags for you. And another guy that can can hit some home runs. Uh, you know, batting average is high. He, he was uh, in the top 10 a couple of the months uh, batting average-wise. 
Uh, he gets on base. He, he's a really smart base runner. Uh, and, you know, he can run the ball down on the outfield as well. I, I, he's one of my uh, favorite up-and-coming Rangers, in my opinion. Have you seen him play much? No, I haven't. But I'm going to keep a closer eye on him this year after a 2020 season. Yeah, Got to love that. Got to love it. Uh, Todd Frazier. How about that name? Did you know he Talk was about old be- guys. I know. They, they <laughs> have him right now plugged into the five hole. Uh, at third base, so I don't know if that's a, you know, they're looking for that stability of a a, a veteran, you know, because losing Beltre the year, you know, that the year before was such a blow to the organization. I guess they felt like, you know, this let's is, get some stability. Well, this is like a youth movement compared to Beltre. <laughs> oh. I'll tell you that right? you Beltre was pushing though. forty, wasn't he? Oh yeah, incredible. He was, he was the most incredible athlete. Yeah, the, I'd say of all the I've watched tons of baseball live. I'm talking live baseball because it's always so different when you're there watching it. <clears throat> and I've seen great players through the years do great things, but for the chunk of years that I got to see him uh, play, I enjoyed Beltre, and I'm I truthfully say this: I enjoyed watching him more than any other player in the league uh, in person. Because he he was always kidding around, but always super intense. You know I mean, what? He, I was just going to mention. Yeah, I saw a video. I, I saw a compilation recently on Twitter of like fifteen or twenty different times when he was playing tricks on the third base coach. Oh you yeah, know, guys in the other dugout. I mean, it looked like he was just having a ball, which is really important to do on you know a game. It's just such a grind, yeah. and that's probably what allowed him to play so many years. Oh, I'll tell you, he used to pull pranks on the, the poor third base coach from the other team all mm-hmm. the time. And, mm-hmm. you know, it just I saw all kinds of stuff he did. And he was always laughing. But I'll tell you, you're not going to find a more uh, as far as defensive third baseman. Mm-hmm. He made plays that are just I'm talking Brooks Robinson kind of level of defensive plays that you just mm-hmm. don't see how he gets to it and has mm-hmm. enough arm to throw it. But it just. For me, I'm I'm a baseball naturalist. I love those, <clears throat> you know, go way to your left, dig it out, and spin and just throw it one armed, and you know, hop mm-hmm. it there and beat the guy by a half a step. And he mm-hmm. did that. I'm almost every game you went to, he did that at least once. And mm-hmm. then <clears throat> you talk about a vicious swing at the plate. He mm-hmm. would swing literally to the point where he dropped to one knee a lot of the time. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And he did not get cheated. The, sometimes the ball went out. There he was yeah. kneeling on home plate, watching mm-hmm. the ball go out of the park and just raise the hands up. I mean, he was, he was fantastic. But I, I had to throw him in there because it just mm-hmm. too many years of enjoying a guy. And you know, I used to get tickets on the third base side just to be over there to to watch his antics the whole time. Mm-hmm. But <clears throat> big shout out there. So Todd Frazier, no clue what to expect from him. I know they're expecting about 19 and 58 of the projections. Uh, you know, uh, we'll see. We'll see how it rolls. You know, I mean, sometimes a veteran presence makes a big difference if you're really trying to make the playoffs, which the Rangers say that they are. Mm-hmm. Or if he's regressed, they'll they'll probably make uh, some switches there. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, Runet uh, uh, or Odor is the sixth hitter. Uh, certainly another corner piece of the Rangers. I remember watching his first at bat like it was yesterday as well. Uh, Interesting guy, though. You know, he's one of those guys that he's fiery, but sometimes it looks like he's totally disengaged. Mm -hmm. You know, one of those guys as a coach, you think, oh, this guy is such a pain in the ass to coach because you can tell, you know, he needs you need to push his buttons, but you can't offend him one of those you got to walk the line on guys that has ability you know at times to carry a team but he also gets in some hellacious slumps as well Mm. so we'll see how it goes you know he's most famous for punching joey batiste in the face so that's right the rangers fans will always love him just for that (laughs) yeah but batista knows exactly how fiery he is but (laughs) when you were talking before about the team in general and, you know, going for home runs, being uh, prone to strikeouts. Odor is the guy I thought about. 
You know, he led the league with 178 strikeouts last year. Yeah. You know, it's like he and Gallo were having a competition. Gallo would have smoked him if he'd been healthy the whole year. But, you know, and Odor mentioned, you know, he, he managed the 30 home runs. But, you know, you mentioned the slumps. He went way down to 205 batting average, yeah. which is pathetic. So yeah. he's just complete boom or bust. Well, they're, you know, projections here, they've, they've got him at 225. So, yikes. You know, he's going to have to do a little bit better than that. Um, there's no doubt about it. You know, by the way, the stats, just to make, just make sure there's no confusion, I, what I'm trying to do here with the stats is look at projections mm-hmm. for this upcoming season, and they take into effect the last few seasons because mm-hmm. some guys got cut short on season. Some, you know, guys were at other teams. So this gives you more of a feel of where they'll what the expectations are and where they'll be in the lineup just to, you know, I, I like looking at that kind of stuff because mm-hmm. really comparing somebody when they were on a different team in a different part of the order, it, it's it's apples and oranges. So I'm trying to give the the best flashpoint of, of what's going to take place. Now, here's a couple of guys that they're the Rangers fans are extremely excited about. Nick Solak came up last year mm-hmm. and just tore it up. I mean, he batted clean up a bunch. He looked like a veteran out there. He's got pop. He's got some wheels. You know, he's a he's a good defender. Uh, just a really up and comer. Uh, I think he'll move up from that seven hole that he's projected in right now as the season goes on. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think they just want to probably not have big pressure on him early on. But he's one of the key components if this team is going to make a true run at making the playoffs. Yeah, I like those, you know, small sample size last year, but I liked his on base was almost 400. His slugging was almost 500. Yeah, yeah that's great for a 25 year old. It is. It really is. I mean, you projected this year, you know, they have his on base at about 350 and his slugging at about 460. So, you know, considering he's so young, uh, and I think he's got some good potential there and he's got a decent eye. He walks some too. So that's a pleasant thing. Um, I don't know if you knew that uh, we got our catcher back. Did you know that? Yeah. What do you take a little cameo in Houston? Robinson Chirinos. Yes. Yeah. And I'll tell you what, that dude can play. I love watching him play. I, I, I thought I, that was a coup getting him back because he can hit. He's a good uh he, calls a good game behind the plate people love the pitchers love pitching to him great attitude um i just think that's a massive even though he bats eighth and his statistics are aren't the greatest i'm telling you from locker room presence to a consistent catcher to the pitching staff you know to timely hitting i think that uh, he's going to be a big upgrade for us yeah, and a guy, another value catcher. And as we know, in DFS, it all comes down to price. And if this guy's yeah. going to be minimum price, and he hit 17 home runs in well under 400 at-bats last year. That's right. You could, you could do a lot worse. Yeah, I mean, this the, the projections have him 352 at-bats is all uh, but 18 homers. So, you know, I know for me, and we talked, I talked a little bit about this with, uh, um, was it Leighton I was on with last time? I just have such a hard time clicking a button mm-hmm. for a guy in the eight or nine hole hitting because mm-hmm. yeah. I just I'm so cognizant that I, that's maybe a bad thing for me. I don't know. But in baseball, it's different than any other sport. You know, mm-hmm. in basketball, you're going to get your run in football. You're going to get your run. But baseball where you bat, I mean, you could lose 25 percent of your potential input into that game by not getting that at bat. And when push comes to shove and it's like, do I take this catcher that's batting fourth or fifth, but his stats are sort of even with like a, uh, you know, Torino's batting eighth. I always falter to the guy that I think is going to get that extra at bat. And again, that could be a mistake, but you know, it's, it's a hard, it's a hard call, you know? Well, the other thing to throw in there is, is, is it on the, on the road or at home? If he's at home, then I'm even more less likely to play him because he might right. not get to hit in the ninth inning. But you always get that extra bump for the guys who are the, the visiting team, you know, to potentially get to bat in the ninth inning. Yeah. And, you know, I've studied very deeply a lot of the winning lineups. And you don't often see an eight or nine hitter in those winning mm-hmm. lineups. Now, you you may see, 
one six hitter, one seven hitter, you know, mm-hmm. and you'll get some of that. Mm-hmm. But, uh, you, you know, you're rolling the dice a little bit on an eight, nine, just just for the simple aspect. If you look at the numbers, you know, mm-hmm. if you look at the numbers, are they going to get that extra at bat is, is what I want to see. So, you know, something to keep an eye on. But if you're in a pinch, you know, and we all get that way, we want to spin down a catcher generally because you're not going to get tons of it's or it's sort of like Gary Sanchez or or take, you know, a minimum pitcher and hopefully he scratches something out uh, Mm -hmm. pretty much. But I mean, there's a few other guys, but uh, so we'll see. I don't know. And then um, right now projected Ronald Guzman at first base, big, tall, lanky, athletic dude, uh, definitely has some pop. Um, Interested to see if he hangs on to that position. Not a lot of first baseman, uh, first baseman bat ninth. So that's mm-hmm. that's your first red flag. Mm-hmm. Um, but I'll tell you, on games where they match him up and move him up to like fifth or sixth, because he, you know, his BVP uh, against somebody or in the right uh, spot, he's he's a sneaky little guy because to to slide in there because he can drive it out of the park. There's no question about it. But we'll see how he goes. Um, you know it, uh, but that's generally the expected lineup at this point. Um, you know, the, really Gallo coming off the injury is going to be a big story. If Solak can take it to the next level, you know, if if uh, Chu and Andrus still have anything in the tank, uh, that's going to be huge. And Frazier as well. I mean, can those guys? You've got a thirty-year lineup or sort of old dudes. Uh, they got to produce so. Uh, We'll see how that goes. But here's the good news. Listen to this rotation, and then we'll talk a bit about it. Corey Kluber, Mike Miner, Lance Lynn, Kyle Gibson, and Jordan Lyles. Now, Texas has notoriously had pretty bad pitching. Nobody wants to pitch here basically because of the ballpark. You know, we've had the U Darvishes and Cole Hamels and those guys. And they all filter out of here. But the big story is going to be, is Corey Kluber going to be the ace that he was with uh, the Indians? Is he going to get that magic back? Uh, He was a Cy Young guy. And he's, I mean, the guy's got potential out of his ears. So I think, again, it all has to do with if they're going to play in the the ballpark or where they're going to play. But... I, I would have him very high on my list uh, of guys to, to, you know, to give a shot against specific teams. His strikeout to walk ratio is terrific. Uh, he has a lot of command of his pitches. You know, he's, he's the consummate kind of guy that can take down a slate for you, you know, with a eight inning, 10 strikeout kind of performance. So, I'm I'm heavily on the Corey Kluber bandwagon. I think he needed badly needed a change of scenery, uh, and I think he's going to have a heck of a season. What do you think? Yeah, I'm with you. Guy, I mean, the guy that's got the great pedigree. He had three years in a row with at least 18 wins, and he's career 9.8 strikeouts per nine. Yeah, that stop. When you're when you're getting up in that 10 10 eight strikeouts per nine. You know, you're you're an elite group of guys right there. So and then, you know, these next two guys to me were the the quietest success story of the season last year. I mean, I cannot tell you how many times Mike Miner, uh, Mike Miner, if I had to put a dollar value on who made the most money for me in DFS last year, it was Mike Miner. I mean, I remember one slate where I took Mike Miner and he was incredibly low owned, like 3% because it happened to be a day that everybody took um, the Dodgers pitcher. Who's the left? Bueller. Kershaw? Everybody, oh, Bueller. Bueller. Everybody took Bueller. Everybody took uh, uh, Scherzer. There were, I mean, there were like four big names out there. Mm-hmm. And, you know, a couple of the guys did okay. A couple of guys got smashed. But the highest scoring DFS pitcher that day was Miner. He pitched a complete game, which you don't get in the majors very often, struck out a decent amount of guys, and just had total control of the game. It was against either Detroit or the White Sox. But, 
you know, having when everybody spent all that salary on those big name guys, I'll tell you, Mike Miner was tough as nails last year. And if you remember what happened with him is he was the number one guy that they were going to trade at the deadline. Everybody wanted Mike Miner. And he sat down with the, the brass at the Rangers and said, listen, I do not want to be traded. I love playing here. Don't trade me. And they said, well, we'll see. We'll see. Well, he came out during that time frame and said, you know, F you and pitched his butt off. He made him, he made himself untradeable. I mean, he had that complete game shutout. He, he just was phenomenal. So they said, fine, we're going to, we're going to re, you know, resist picking up some, some young talent and make him a key component. And the fact that he gets to be the number two guy to Kluber, I think is phenomenal. And I'll tell you, the, the story behind Lance Lynn isn't far behind Mike Miner. This is a guy that with the Cardinals and everything was just sort of an average pitcher, had some good games, had some bad games. But this guy was nails last year, too. I mean, every time the Rangers got into a slump, then it'd come to Miner and Lynn. Either they both won or one of them always won. They just kept the Rangers from plummeting down. Uh, you know, from 500 just because of those two guys. So I'm, I'm high on both of them. I think they both, you know, can strike out 200 plus for the season and you can get them cheaper uh, than, than some of the other big names. And if you catch them against the right team in the right spot, uh, they're difference makers. So I know it sounds bizarre because of the ballpark and all these years, but you can target Rangers pitchers this year because if they play in the neutral ballparks, it neutralizes everybody. Or if they do get to play in the new ballpark, it's supposed to be fair both for hitters and pitchers. So I think Kluber Miner and Lynn are going to make a lot of my lineups. Yeah. You know what I like about both of those guys? They both had 200 innings, both had 200 Ks. Yep. And like, as you mentioned with them bumping down with Kluber's presence to the two and three, then you can pitch them, and you're not pitching them against the opposing team's aces as much. So you exactly. get that nice, nice little edge. You wouldn't be, you'd be surprised how many times Miner had a pitch against all the top dogs. I mean, it, it happened all the time. So it's like you said, it it, it gives you a different uh, feel too uh, with when they take the mound. I, and pitchers, you know, pitchers, you know, baseball better than any of us probably. And they uh, they're such head game kind of guys. So, you know, if, if you're going out there and pitching against a Max Scherzer, you're thinking, damn, I can't give up a run. But if you're going against a second or third banana, you know, you feel like you got a little bit more confidence going out there. And that makes a big difference. Um, now, the four or five guys, uh, I am not sure what to think. I'd love to get your opinion. Uh, Kyle Gibson and Jordan Lyles, you know, the picture of sort of 500 kind of pitchers with some ability, uh, you know, guys, they say, you know, they've got a live arm. They can strike some people out. I mean, do you like either one of those guys? Well, yeah, yeah I, you know, I think that's a fair description in terms of, you know, 500 type pitchers. Um, Gibson does give you nine strikeouts per nine. Yeah. Um, and that's not bad for a fourth starter. No, no, not at all. But he does get popped quite a bit and gives up decent amount of homers. That's one concern. But, you know, they're boomer bust guys, in my opinion. I don't know if they're super rosterable right now in, in DFS. But, you know, with strikeout potential, which they both have, actually, Lyles can strike out some guys, uh, you know, maybe on short slates where you want to save some money and load up on hitters. You know, if it's a, if if they do play in their parks and – it's a Rockies day, you know, they could be the bridge to stack in three or four Rockies. So uh, it's the first time I can remember ever looking at a, a starting five rotation for the Rangers and saying this, this rotation is pretty damn good. You know, usually it's, it's one guy at the top, like a, you know, uh, you Darvish, and then you got a bunch of minor league dudes or something, but uh, these guys have, pitched in the league they all have experience uh and they all have potential so i'm sort of excited i would be too if i were you i mean this is you know 
a fun team to think about in terms of having some veterans. Um, and you just never know. Guys with that experience, maybe they click, maybe they bond if they're in this unique setting, you know, away from home together. Um, you know, it's a tough division with, with Houston and Oakland there, but I like the veteran presence up and down the lineup and in the rotation. Yeah, I think there's, there's some great potential there. So hopefully we get to see it play out and hopefully – uh, we get to see a majority of the season. What What is your latest determination on how many games they'll play for the regular season? Let's see, if we start in late June, um, I'd say about 100 games. Yeah. I, I bet that'll be a target. And then play playoffs a little bit later than usual. You know, maybe if they if they if they squeeze in a bunch of double headers, you get closer to 120 games. You know, you get um, basically 75 percent of the season. Yeah, I think if they came away with that, they'd be pretty psyched. I think so too. I I think a hundred is the bottom line as far as it being the sample size they need in baseball. I think they may even get 120. Who knows? Because mm-hmm. they've already said they're going to have a lot of double headers, etc. But you know, they're working on all of that uh, as we speak. But, you know, the only concern will be come playoff time, they better pray it's not like, you know, the Yankees or the Indians or teams where they'll be playing in the snow. So, uh, you know, in that case, I hope it's the warm weather teams. You know, they may even make the World Series at a neutral site like the Super Bowl and just play it somewhere warm. I mean, that's an option as well. Um, you know, I've heard a lot of chit chat about that. And, and actually they even talked about it <clears throat> here in Dallas because of the new ballpark and, and the facilities there. So we'll see how that plays out, but it should be fun for sure. Uh, but that's it for me on the Rangers, man. And, and like I say, you know, the takeaways, I guess today are the Mariners are not good. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, steer clear of the Mariners definitely stack against some of their pitchers. And then the Rangers, Uh, you know, well, let's watch how the veterans start out and don't be afraid to roster some of these speed guys, uh, because they do have some potential for some uh, steals. And then, you know, I think we can roster some Texas Rangers pitchers, which I've never said uh, those words combined together uh, (laughs) in a preseason atmosphere. (laughs) So uh, that's basically it, man. Um, Again, for the for the listeners out there, you can catch us seven days a week. Uh, the audio will be on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, Podbean, iHeart, <clears throat> Spotify, and, and then the video will be uh, uploaded on YouTube, and we'll have that on our Discord for our members and also on Twitter. Uh, we do ask, whether you see the audio or video, uh, that you would uh, jump on there, take a few seconds if you give us a five stars and a comment on iTunes, you're in our drawing. That's the first Sunday of every month for a free one month membership. Uh, also, you know, click those alerts. That's the key. Put the little alarm on YouTube. It's the best way to do it. So then when we upload it and it's ready to go, you'll get a notification saying, you know, the podcast is ready to be listened to. Uh, those thumbs up, thumbs ups mean a lot. Um, you know, and, especially now that you get to see our faces on YouTube. Let's hope we don't get any of these. (laughs) (laughs) We get some of these. (laughs) So, you know, bald is beautiful, my friends. Bald is beautiful. Yes, it is. (laughs) (laughs) And uh, the last thing, too, we always mention on every show, our uh, real uh, heartfelt uh, company that we like to say, hey, this is somewhere you want to donate your money. If you're going to donate money, I know everybody's struggling in COVID times, but the Mamba on 3org that's M A M B A O N T H R E E.org, set up by Vanessa Bryant. Just a fantastic cause for the families uh, that survived that uh, terrible crash. So I'll tell you, I, I was, uh, I'll, I'll end on this because uh, I really didn't mention it yesterday because we went so long. But I know uh, ESPN's highest rated show in a long, long time and their highest rated ever documentary was the the last stand you know the michael jordan thing and it just it it brought back so much competitiveness and remembering you know in my entire lifetime of sports it 
the only person for me that's ever been able to push that button inside of me, the two people were Michael Jordan and Kobe Bryant. I, I never saw a more dominant, confident person than those two guys. And they're so much similar too. And watching Jordan, I haven't seen a lot of those clips in 30 years. And I lived all those. And it mm -hmm. just, it, it brought out like that competitive, I am ready to go. That's my takeaway from that is it's Kobe, it's Michael. And, you know, I mentioned earlier, I put sort of a diatribe up there on our discord, just, you know, from that gut feeling from those guys. Cause you know, it, I hope people are learning something from watching this and I can't wait to watch all the rest of them. But from Jordan's perspective, the, just the, the level of not confidence or cockiness or anything, the level of hard work and the level of laying all of it out there, never taking a playoff, I mean, people forget Jordan was defensive player of the year three years in a row, that he led the league in steals, and all of that is effort. You know, he could have easily scored his 40 and just played okay defense, but he dogged the crap out of people every possession. And you'll see a lot of it on this next couple shows when it shows the fights they had with the Pistons because that was just a knockdown drag out. But uh, you'll see Jordan never back down, just like Kobe, and... So enjoy those. I loved it. I couldn't wait to talk about it, uh, you know, and when we had time to do it. And, uh, you know, I'm telling you, learn lessons from it. Take the listen, watch Kobe stuff. Listen to some of his talks. And same thing with Michael, because uh, they're identical. And to me, I've never seen anybody at that level uh, bef before or after. So great stuff, man. Yeah, well, I really liked your message to our members last night in Discord. Very inspiring, and I know it comes a lot from Jordan and Kobe. And for me, the great thing about them is their competitive drive. And, you you know, we see, we see that in this documentary, The Last Dance with Jordan, whether it's on the court or playing overseas, an exhibition game, or, you know, putting a hundred, you know, six figures on playing one golf hole against somebody. And for me, the, the third guy was always Larry Bird growing up in New England, a guy who's just going to dive on the floor no yeah. matter what. He'll give up his body, and that's what cut his career short, all those back injuries, because he just would not stop. And no. you know that, that's the sort of mentality that we love and appreciate, and that's how we attack every slate at DFS Coach Talk, uh, where we just try to prepare in, until, the last, until the last minute, until there's no more time to go. Right. And, and the thing that sets us apart is, you know, again, we never use optimizers. We don't dump a bunch of numbers in looking for those statistics and percentages as far as to play this guy 8%, that guy 9%. We take a look at the whole picture. And like I said, I've been watching all of this off season or COVID time taking notes. I sat through painfully watching those stupid 2K contests with the guys playing each other because I wanted to learn what they were doing. And, you know, we've talked about this on a couple of the pods, but it was evident guys like, you know, a Levine are going to be ready to roll hundred percent geared up, ready to roll. And guys like Aiton who admitted he hadn't done mm -hmm. one cardio thing, you mm -hmm. know, guys like that are going to be behind and you can see the different attitudes of certain people. And, you know, there was, I posted something in discord as well, uh, you know, there was uh, something in there with guys that are working out, you know, busting their tail to be ready for as soon as sports comes back. And, you know, those are important things to know because, you know, you if you just expect to just jump back in, look at those algorithms and statistics and optimizers, they're not considering all of the, the details of the difference makers that are going to help you win and take down, whether it's cash or GPP, it's going to have a huge effect on both. Yeah, Zach Levine, he's out there. I, I saw the finals of that horse competition. He's out there in the rain shooting yeah. around on the back, you know, on the back court while Aiton's on the couch playing video games. I mean, <laughs> it makes a difference. <laughs> it, there's no doubt about it, man. No <laughs> doubt. Well, fantastic. Any Anything else? Uh, uh, tune there? in again tomorrow. we got the Athletics and the Angels we're going to be breaking down. Fantastic. Who's on those? Do you know? That's Andy and I. You and Andy. Okay. So mm -hmm. you'll get 
a, a much better looking partner than I. So, <laughs> the, you know, you may get a little bit better ratings in this one. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, that that's fantastic. Those are two good teams I'm interested to listening to for sure. Um, other than that, just keep tuning in. You know, we're going to ride this out. And hopefully we have a time that when we're done with these breakouts that, that we're ready to go. So, uh, we really appreciate appreciate everybody uh, listening. Thank you so much for joining us for another uh, episode of DFS Coach Talk. For Andrew Gallagher and the rest of our guys, Andrew Hansen, Mike Apatria, all of our baseball folks, uh, Santino, uh, Brett. We've got Leighton. We've got such a team. It's unbelievable. For all those guys, uh, I am Coach. We'll catch you again when we look to prepare to crush it in DFS. All right, buddy. We stayed under that that uh, time frame that is the no no. So we're right at about a, an hour twenty. Yeah. Did, did you hit stop? Because it still says that it's, you're recording the call. Yeah, I, I still am. I just always leave that and then chop it.